as of today, probably Bangladesh has cor higher corporate tax rate into the comparable emerging markets. I'm sure progressively that will also be looked at. Implementation of mega projects denotes commitment to development and are essentially to sustain future growth, development of skill set and progression. Putting all the factors together to create a virtuous cycle of growth. Areas to focus, regional connectivity, policy coordination and digitization, investment infrastructure, human capital, sustainable growth and development. Lastly, in conclusion, we would like to believe that Bangladesh is in a great place to ride the emerging opportunities and some key areas to focus for growth investment can be accelerate investment in infrastructure to provide basic environment to attract and incubate investment, reduce dependency on RNG and textile by expanding and diversifying export basket. The gap between China and Bangladesh is huge in terms of export in RNG, so there is still ample opportunities there but other areas will need to increase, maybe digital area, software development, agriculture processing, pharma, shoes, toys, and so on and so forth. Skill set development for the future business, investment opportunity in social infrastructure, healthcare, education, etc. So in the end, I think we should feel confident that it is for the country to seize the opportunity. Thanks very much to Dhaka Chamber and commerce and industry for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much for your patience and listening to me. Allah Hafiz, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Abrar. We are running short of time. Uh, at this point of time, Mr. Taiki Koga, Taiki Koga is a representative of the Jetro Dhaka office. Koga worked for overseas business support division of services industry support division of Jetro's headquarters in Tokyo. Koga, you are welcome. Please take maximum, because we are running short of time. Okay. Maximum five to seven minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for introducing me, Lama-san, and Mr. Najibul Lama-san, uh, Dr. Shamir Alam, and other distinguished guests and speakers and ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be here today. I'm Taiki Koga, representative of Jetro Dhaka. I really celebrate six decades anniversary of DCCA and ensure that future prosperity of DCCA. Uh, we, JETRO, are promoting Japanese trade and investment all over the world, and we have more than 70 branches in over 50 countries. And in Bangladesh, we found 269 Japanese companies who have entities. Half of them are garments-related companies like uh, garment factories, logistics companies, and buying house, and inspection companies. But regarding with Japanese Bangladesh statistics, Japanese investment is more diverse than other countries. That's why Bangladesh government gives good reputation to us. And in these days, other types of businesses are more aggressive than before, especially following three sectors. First, infrastructure business. Our Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, decided to pay two, a $6 billion loan to Bangladesh in 2014. Many Japanese companies come and do business in many Japanese ODA projects. For example, Matabari Coal Plant, Power Plant, Three Metal Lane, Third Terminal in International Airport, and New International Airport. When you calculate 
all Japanese ODA project budget, you can find out that six billion, six million dollars will not be enough. And second, workforce exporting business. Japanese population started to decrease. We are facing shortage of workforce in many things. Especially in rural area, only elderly people are there. Bangladesh has big population and has a lot of experience to send people outside. JICA have already started to send IT technicians to Japan. It is called Bijet program. And third, consumer goods business. Now, Bangladesh is grow up so rapidly and so stably. The total GDP of Bangladesh is bigger than Vietnam. GDP per capita is bigger than Myanmar and Cambodia. According to Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics, more than 70% of Bangladesh GDP consists of consumption. Japanese rate is only 55%. Japan Tobacco will invest the largest amount in Bangladesh history because it found out the potential of Bangladesh market. Regarding with priority sectors of Bangladesh, agro, ICT, and light engineering is very acceptable, and we can easily cooperate. In addition, consumer goods and logistics also have good potential in Bangladesh, so we would like to focus on them. And to explain the Japanese investment, I can't avoid touching the tragedy Grushin attack. Just after the attack, many meeting appointments were canceled and the business situation got worse in Japanese business. All Japanese were reluctant to go outside and a private situation was also chaos. Yet, it was not our will and reality. Japanese companies didn't want to stop their business. We need more than one year to semi-purify our memories to come here back. Of course, it is difficult to clear them all soon, but they know that it is high time to take business opportunities in Bangladesh. If you came one year later, you couldn't get the opportunities. They cannot wait. Now, they are searching many business seeds from Bangladesh field. Japanese investment will also increase day by day. Japanese trade and investment are very expensive. Everyone's seen that. But we cannot compromise our quality. But they also know that Japanese trade and investment are bright and sophisticated. I can say that Japan is the most reliable partner for Bangladesh. Bangladesh will become a middle and high income country in the future. We can predict that great future of Bangladesh as well. On the road to glory of Bangladesh, Japan should always be next to you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you for calling me here. Thank you. Mr. Koga, excellent. Thank you very much for managing the time. May I now invite Mr. Abdul Muktadi, Chairman and Managing Director of Inceptor Pharmaceuticals and Inceptor Vaccine Limited. Mr. Muktadi is a leading business personality of Bangladesh. He established Inceptor Pharmaceuticals in 1999. Under his dynamic leadership, within a decade, Inceptor has grown as a leading drug manufacturer of the country. Now I understand it is number two in the country. 
Mr. Moktadir, floor is yours. Thank you, sir, Mr. Chairman. Honorable panelists, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. First of all, I thank Dhaka Chamber for giving me this opportunity to say something uh, in this wonderful event. Our keynote speaker mentioned about the very exciting statistics of Bangladesh, its rise and the future. I would like to examine how Bangladesh has come to this level. If you look into the rise of Bangladesh, especially in the export market, it is basically apparel, garment industry. There are many countries in the world, they have been manufacturing this. The history of apparel industry in Pakistan and India is maybe 150 years old or even older. Bangladesh started in 1980 only. How come Bangladesh could export more than India and Pakistan combined together? There is one element is reliability. If a Bangladeshi entrepreneur said that we are going to send you the goods of this quality within this time, he would not care whether he's going to make a profit or loss, he will stick to his words. This is what is required in business, and Bangladesh has it. This is inbuilt in our character. We have to further nourish this. If I go to USA or UK or other, any other places, uh, you'd see that many generic drugs are sold. And they will ask you this question. Will you be able to supply the medicine on time with right quality? So this is the thing that is people are asking for at this moment, the reliability. And I think by culturing this particular culture, we should be able to excel in our area of works. In our growth terms, tremendous amount of necessity is in the area of education. I was talking to Riyadh on, he said, why are you not going to go to Africa? Africa is a wonderful market and Africa can provide you higher prices for the medicine and everything. I said that wherever we go, we, find, we found out that it is, it is extremely difficult to find out a reliable partner to do business with. So this is what we have to give it to the international community that Bangladesh can provide reliability. If we can continue to do that, I think that is what is going to take Bangladesh far, far ahead of all other nations. I will give you some information about the investment and growth, particularly in the pharmaceutical field. If you go back like 40 years, you'd see that most of the pharmaceutical market uh, is dominated by multinational companies. 85% of the market was dominated by multinational companies. Now, maybe less than 10% is multinational companies. More than 90% is Bangladesh. So mostly the investment and growth that are coming from the local entrepreneurs. Currently, there are as many as 20 different pharmaceutical companies combinedly every year investing close to $700 million every year. And within the 10 years' time, there is every possibility that we would invest alone in Bangladesh in pharmaceutical sector more than $10 billion. And every single company is gearing up now to tap the global market. And time is not so far away when Bangladeshi pharmaceutical companies would probably supply to United States, all over Western Europe, Australia, South Africa, and those developed countries where the uses of generic medicine is highly defined. And Bangladesh is going to sell 
most of their products in those advanced countries. When that is, that is, that is going to happen, slowly there is a trickling effect. In branded generics, most of African markets, as well as in southeastern market and other emerging markets in Latin America, Bangladesh pharmaceutical companies are going to create brands and they are going to sell their products. I foresee in the next five to 10 years time, Bangladesh pharmaceutical sector would be one of the leading, leading export hubs. And these are all, there is nothing but intellectual property there. The only thing, the asset or capital that is necessary in these cases are human capital. And fortunately, there are 40 universities who are preparing pharmacies, chemists, biochemists, engineers, whatever is required for pharmaceutical industry. And there is a tremendous shift taking place that if you go 20 years back, you'd see most of the medicines are manufactured through chemical processes. There, there are big industries, chemical compounds are required, mines are required, a lot of things that is required which would actually add value and becoming a small organic synthetic compound which is used as medicine. But if you look at now, today, most of the, most, the highest number of products that are coming into the market, as well the highest selling products, all of them are biologics. And they are derived from cells, some kind of cells. And it does not require anything else but biological procedure, which is live in nature and does not require that kind of industrial production. It requires some industrial production, but it's more of a biological production system. There, Bangladesh is advancing, and within a short period of time, you are likely to see there are as many as 10 different products. In fact, there are five or six already done, 10 different biologics. They are all manufactured in Bangladesh from the cellular level. And there, if you look at the capability of Bangladesh, they are at par with United States, most of the Western European countries, and Japan, Korea, India, and China. They, these are the six or seven countries who have mastered into the production of biologics. And I'm very fortunate to uh, inform you that Bangladesh is also joining that particular club, and Bangladesh is manufacturing those kind of biological products as well as vaccines. I have been approached, you'd be amazed to hear that, I have been approached by the health minister of Turkey, state minister of health of Malaysia, to give technology to those countries to manufacture biological drugs. So this is the status of Bangladesh, that we are much, much more ahead compared to all these countries of the world, and we are capable of manufacturing these biologics and vaccines in Bangladesh. So this is the trend is going on, and like pharmaceutical sector, I'm sure that there are many other uh, striking, highly uh, technologically developed sectors are developing in Bangladesh, which will eventually take Bangladesh forward. So for these things to happen, we need investment, and fortunately these investments are coming from within the country itself. We are not dependent on, on anybody else, all we need is to train our people scientifically into high uh, level of science, which is happening, but it needs more attention, which we are going to take care of. And once we are able to do that, then all these things which are actually coming from human brain power, we are going to export this country. Bangladesh has to flourish on export-led economy. And this is where we are going to support Bangladesh and all others who are joining our hands together to make Bangladesh an export-led country. And high value addition will come from all those intellectual activities rather than working really hard uh, on sweatshops, which I think will transform Bangladesh eventually into a very high-income country. I once again thank Dhaka Chamber for giving me this opportunity and speaking in front of such a wonderful gathering. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mukhtadi.
and uh, you have uh, spoken from your own experience in this field. At, at this point of time, may I invite Dr. M. Mashur Riaz, Senior Economist and Program Manager of IFC, World Bank Group. Dr. Riaz, since 2012, has World Bank Group's Investment Climate Reform Program in Bangladesh. He led WBG's Investment Climate Program in Nepal, 2013 to 14, and many to his credentials has been serving Bangladesh IFC office here. And we are uh, so thankful for all his cooperation to the private sector in the country. Dr. Riaz. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, Today's session's chair, uh, Mr. Mabu Rahman, President ICC, respected chief guest, Principal Secretary, Mr. Najibur Rahman, uh, my fellow panelists, presenter, uh, DCCI President, board members, members, ladies and gentlemen, salam alaikum and uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate uh, Dhaka Chamber uh, for this very timely, I emphasize timely, and well-structured uh, conference. And I re the reason I said timely, I was talking to a friend right during the break, and the gentleman, with all good intention, was wondering, with the two months uh, to run up to the election, this was a bold, probably a bold move to hold a business or a investment conference. And I said the timing could not have been better with eight or nine or ten weeks left to an election this is probably what private sector of any country should do, is highlighting the opportunities and challenges that a country has in terms of trade and investment and firmly get the messages out to the future policy makers, many of whom were present today and hopefully will be present throughout the day today. Uh, Mr. Anwar made an excellent presentation. Uh, we saw a number of very key, sh a number of important issues highlighted there. Very strong evidence on Bangladesh's progress over the last few decades, both on economic and social front. But it also touched upon a long ignored area, which is the regional cooperation, which has only recently been taking or gaining pace. And thank you for highlighting that. It's critical for Bangladesh's future growth opportunities. But it also combine the issues of human capital, infrastructure, and productivity in outlining Bangladesh's future growth potential and the trajectory. So thank you, Mr. Anwar, for highlighting such important areas. So I just wanted to share my thoughts with you by focusing on three questions. Uh, the first one is, why is Bangladesh a gateway to growth and investment? What's there? What's special? So I think to get to that answer, one has to look at Bangladesh's track record over the last few decades, uh, where we see a tremendous social, and a lot, lot, lot of that have been highlighted by Mr. Anwar in his presentation, tremendous progress on both socioeconomic front. Uh, if we see growth has been broad-based and consistently increasing uh, for last almost two decades, it's been around 6%, and last few years, it's been hovering around 7%. But more importantly, the growth has been inclusive. So based on this inclusive growth, poverty was more than halved between 2000 and 2016. The trade uh, GDP ratio doubled from 18 in around 1990 uh, to around 36% in 2017. And if you look at the gender empowerment, Bangladesh stands number one in South Asia. If you look at the latest gender gap index by World Economic Forum, it's 40, uh, seventh out of 144 countries, which is the best position of among any South Asian countries uh, in, in the latest index. Now, now the gateway the is gateway also created based on the strength or the resilience Bangladesh has demonstrated in its run-up to this uh, impressive track record. And if you look at the strength, what are these strengths? Many. Just to highlight a few, it's the 50th largest export economy in the world. It's the 42nd largest economy already. And based on that, WTO categorizes Bangladesh as the largest merchandise exporter among the LDC countries. But more critically, a figure I love to quote whenever I'm talking about potential of Bangladesh. Bangladesh is in Bang for Bangladesh, the share of manufactured goods 
in its total export is about 90%, highest among any LDC countries, and the average for LDC is only 26%. So that tells you the, 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 the track record Bangladesh has secured based on its uh, labor-intensive, volume-oriented manufacturing largely targeted towards international markets, which in turn uh, fuel the domestic economy. If another strength of Bangladesh, if you look at the labor cost, it's one-third of Indonesia. It's, it's about half of Cambodia, and it's one-fourth of China. If you look at Bangladesh's potential and hear about competitors, you will hear these are the countries which are the competitors, but then the country is offering a strong labor cost differential. Uh, but the biggest strength I see over the last decade and certainly in the recent years is that Bangladesh's pro-private sector inclusive growth policies, which led to expansion of Bangladesh's private sector both in the export as well as in the domestic sector, but also led to significant increase in waged income for a big part of the population, leading to rural e dynamism in the rural economy, which in turn created a bigger domestic market in the country. Part of the answer why Bangladesh is a gateway also lies in Bangladesh's potential. We have heard during the uh, inaugural session as well as Mr. Anwar's presentation, Bangladesh, based building on its impressive growth trajectory, it's poised to become the 28th largest uh, by 2030. Bangladesh is also enjoying a demographic dividend. By demographic dividend, I try to highlight that Bangladesh now has more working age people in its population than non-working edge, and it is meant to continue for many, many decades. Now, what that creates is a big market on one hand for market-seeking investment, both for local and multinational and foreign investors, but it also creates building on the young part, which is a large part of this demographic dividend, the youths, a uh, perfect market for efficiency-seeking investment, which will take advantage of Bangladesh's factor market efficiencies and then serve the global value chains around the world. Regional connectivity, Mr. Abrar mentioned that. Bangladesh's potential is really untapped and underutilized in regional cooperation. We heard that Bangladesh can almost double, but I would say Bangladesh can treble its regional trade. The overall South Asia regional trade for goods at the moment is $23 billion. Uh, one of our internal, the World Bank Group study shows that it can be trebled to $68 billion within next five years, and Bangladesh can take a significant for portion of that expanding pie. The world apparel market, which is important because Bangladesh's private sector growth has had many legs, but the most important or the in terms of export volume, the most important leg was the ready-made garment. The world apparel market is expected to grow from 1.8 trillion currently to 2.5 trillion by 2025. That's an increase of $700 billion in the next seven years. And Bangladesh, the second largest manufacturer of ready-made garments, uh, which has strong labor cost advantage, can certainly take advantage of that. So, the track record, the strength, and the potential, they all denote, they all point to this very strong gateway for growth and investment. My next question, the strategies which have helped Bangladesh to come to this stage, to this, through this impressive journey, is it enough to get to the next level of potential or the, what awaits Bangladesh in terms of opportunities? At one level, probably yes. The growth strategy has been private sector oriented, private sector led and taking advantage of international markets which fuel then domestic economy. That part of the strategy should work pretty well for Bangladesh as well. But adjustments are necessary in terms of what Bangladesh presents as its comparative advantage and also competitive advantage. The labor cost differential is no longer going to be the sufficient reason to get Bangladesh enough dynamism or enough of a share in the international markets. Productivity is an important area, and that's where Bangladesh has to do much better. Bangladesh's current productivity level is about uh, one-sixth of China, 
and probably half of India. That needs to be significantly improved. And Bangladesh needs to further strengthen a number of its growth drivers, FDI, uh, the overall ease of doing business, which was also referred to by Mr. Anwar in his presentation, as well as its overall trade environment. So my third question, what can it do in terms of policy uh, actions or policy levers? I'll leave uh, this distinguished audience with five thoughts there. First, a world-class investment climate or business environment where you have very efficient regulatory delivery, one-stop shop, an excellent initiative by the government, hopefully when it is fully rolled out, should help Bangladesh get the right regulatory delivery. Uh, the overall regulatory framework, it was referred to by my, Mr. Anwar's many of his slides, the regulatory framework can be further modernized to take advantage of the 21st century challenges. Second, agglomeration of economies bring the infrastructure and the supporting services to the production centers. Special economic zones, once again, is the right step forward. And hopefully, once we see the special economic zones in action with uh, machines rolling out, this should significantly strengthen Bangladesh's overall agglomeration. Third, uh, and looking at Nasim Bhai here and Muktadir Bhai here, it's all about export diversification or greater participation in global value chain. The recent trend in export market is an integrated uh, participation in the, defined by the global value chains around the world. And that's where Bangladesh's current participation is 36%. Bangladesh needs to diversify into new sectors such as pharmaceutical, leather and footwear, plastics, light manufacturing, ICT and so on. And for that, Bangladesh needs stronger approach in technology and skills adoption as well as simpler trade environment with trade policies and trade facilitation. And I thank today's chief guest, Mr. Najibur Rahman, for his excellent leadership in upgrading Bangladesh's trade environment when he was the senior secretary IRD and chairman NBR. And the fourth is farm capabilities by adopting technology and skills, and the fifth, long-term finance. I'll stop there and wish Dhaka Chamber all the best in its coming days and years. Thank you. Thank you, Mashur. Thank you, Mashur. At this point of time, may I invite Sayyid Nasim Manzoor, Managing Director, Apex Footwear Limited. Nasim Manzoor, uh, is the chairman of Landmark Footwear Limited and director of Quantum Consumer Solutions, Blue Ocean Footwear, Apex Investment, Guardian Life Insurance, and is also director of Apex Tenor Limited, Apex Pharma, Gray Advertising and Pioneer Insurance, and so on. And he has the direct experience of the leather sector and more particularly the shoes in the world. The Apex, they advertise the wearing the shoe <laughs> the, to the world. Nasim. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, with the permission of the chair, I've been allowed to say protocol observed to save time. Uh, the president of Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Ike Khan, the directors, and the past presidents, I would like to congratulate Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry for an excellent 60 years of representing the best of Bangladesh that we believe is business in Bangladesh. Thank you very much for your great service. I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity. As our distinguished leader has said, I am a shoemaker. I'm a Bangladeshi shoemaker and proud to call myself a shoemaker. The Bangla word is not considered as polite, it's muchi, but I also introduce myself as a muchi and I'm proud to say that as well. Uh, Bangladesh is building Bangladesh. I love that. I think that's a great line to start with. And I'm going to give away my question, but what do ice-breaking ships, Japanese golf clubs, uh, Burberry trench coats, Timberland shoes, uh, etc., all have in common? They're all made in Bangladesh. And I think that's where the Bangladeshi story needs to be told. And as my friend Masrur says all the time, we don't tell our story well enough. We are very shy in how we tell our story compared to some of our competing nations. Now, I'm not going to do the usual numbers and statistics that we all know by heart now. They are 
I would say, admirable, 6% plus growth over a decade, 7% plus over the last three years, et cetera, et cetera. But we know them by heart. And rather, I would like to concentrate on the two topics that I was given to speak about, which Abra Anwar touched on so brilliantly in his paper, um, growth and investment. Let's talk about investment. On the investment side, Bangladesh has been truly unique, I think, compared to some of our peer countries, because the investment has been domestic. The investment has been driven by people in this room and by thousands, if not lakhs, of people like us in this country, who often, I believe, are not recognized enough for what we do. If you talk about the SMEs, which DCCI represents so fabulously, they are the real growth drivers of this country, not the large corporates, because they create the jobs. But even though it's been funded by local, the reality is that this is not going to be enough. And as Bangladesh scales up, we will need more and more quality and more sustained foreign direct investment. Because foreign direct investment doesn't just bring capital, it brings technology, it brings know-how, it brings skills that Abra touched upon, it brings quality consciousness, and it brings marketing. Out of the $13 billion of leather footwear exports that Vietnam will do this year, 75% comes from foreign-owned firms. Bangladesh, even though we are number two and we do about one and a half billion dollars a year, it's mainly domestic driven, domestic investors. That's good, but it's not good enough. Um, the second point of it about investment, I believe, really is about timing. And if you look at what happened yesterday, the Japanese prime minister is visiting China. If you look at President Trump's administration threatening 200 billion dollars of tariffs, over the next 12 months, which will touch every single product that the American consumer buys from China, this is a moment in time which Bangladesh needs to capitalize on. We need to tell our story, we need to go to friendly source countries like Japan, and we need to tell them about Bangladesh. I was chatting with Abra Anwar. I don't know enough about the Malaysian market, and I'm sure the Malaysian market doesn't know we make quality footwear. That's our mistake, and I think that's where we can do better. The second part of it that I think we talked about uh, Abra talked about in his, in his presentation was regional connectivity. How many of you know that the second largest market for footwear in the world is no longer America? The first is Europe in terms of value. The second is India. It's right next door. It's 30 minutes by air, three hours to 12 hours by truck, depending on Benapol. But it's there. Yet our exports to India are minuscule. We don't attack that market at all. We talk about the Chindia advantage, right? China and India, we are strategically located two of the fastest growing economies in the world, but we don't do enough, I think, to attract investment from or target our exports towards these countries. Now, Dr. Masrur talked about the demographic dividend, Bangladesh's profitation. Yes, absolutely, but there is also a window to this dividend. If you just keep on talking about it and talking about it, the window will close in 15 to 20 years, and then we are done and then we will have a higher population that will need to be supported by a smaller population, which is exactly the opposite of what we have now. Second part of the topic that we are supposed to talk about, growth. Yes, we have had good growth, decent growth, but growth needs to accelerate, and we need to concentrate on quality, inclusive growth, as well as an environmentally sustainable growth. Now, if I look at what Bangladesh has done so far, and I said this in many places, Bangladesh has been brilliant at leapfrogging. I see friends here from the IT sector, communication sector. We kind of jumped from landline straight into cell phone with a little bit of fiber optic in middle. But even leapfrogging is not going to be enough anymore. Because if you talk about what Dr. Masuri has talked about, the manufacturing advantage of Bangladesh. This is what I see as the Bangladesh story, where we, can, we should become a factory to the world which is what China has been, and we can be a small percentage of that with the help of our friends from China and the help of our friends from China, Japan and likewise countries. But are we really competitive? The footwear industry where I work, our biggest competition today is Portugal and Spain. Our average cost of labor is 150 US dollars in our factory, minimum wage. Portugal is 450 euros, but their productivity is six times higher. They are more productive. The lead time is one month, they turn around in 21 days, they're made in Europe, they can do small orders, and they're faster. Bangladesh, currently averaging 62 days lead time just on shipment time between here and there. <clears throat> so, if we are going to 
transition from the typical manufacturing that we've done for the last three, three decades, which is OEM manufacturing, original equipment manufacturing, to the next phase, which we call ODM manufacturing, where we actually design the product as well as sell it. We don't just get the tech pack, get the design and make, sell our labor. We have to stop selling labor. And we have to start making designs, creating designs, creating intellectual property, as was said earlier. Now, what do we do, need to do that? We will need education, we will need skills, we will need infrastructure, we will need a better quality of human resource than we do now. So I will leave you with what I would like to see as the five low-hanging fruit that I think we can do over the next 12 months to improve this growth and investment scenario in Bangladesh. First, skills training needs to be incentivized. We have Mr. Najibur Rahman, who has tremendous experience in the National Board of Revenue. If you go to Thailand, the Thailand has a skills development fund where 200% of investment in training is a tax write-off. In Bangladesh, try to do that. The NBR, sir, adds back the cost of training because they don't see this as a deductible. We are harassed to do training. This cannot continue. This needs to be changed. Second, advanced income tax and VAT on technology transfer, royalty and know-how fees. Those of you who work in technology, know-how is not free. We have archaic and outdated laws that link our cost of technology transfer to our profitability. Today, if Muktadir Bhai has to get technology from some of the best biopharma companies in the world, they don't care about whether he makes a profit. They will give him the know-how on the base of a certain money that they want. Our law says, no, it's capped on how, what your profitability is. There is one interpretation from BIDA, one interpretation from the tax authorities. We are now making technology transfer 27% more expensive than it needs to be. If I spend a million dollars on acquiring a brand, I need to spend $270,000 on paying to acquire that brand. Why? Our competition in China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos do not have to do this. Third, we all know this, reduction of the tax rate. Thank you, Abra Anwar. Thank you, Masrur. We need to do this. We cannot go on paying 27% tax, especially because so few of us pay the tax. This needs to be rationalized. This needs to be simplified. Fourth, I'm sure some of our foreign friends in this room will talk about the visa regime. I would urge Mr. Najibur Rahman in his present position to talk about a visa-free regime from Bangladesh. For all G20 countries, for all ASEAN countries, we should encourage people to come to Bangladesh. The fact that they want to come should be enough. Why do we need to harass them to get visa on arrival? Have you ever stood in that line? Do you know what it takes? It's terrible. It has to be changed. We need to encourage and make life easier. Last but not least, Dhaka Airport. Please, hand it over to somebody who knows how to manage an airport. The first impression is the last impression. You cannot go on doing this and expect investment to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Nasim, for your candid presentation and also comments and observations. And we are very thankful to Mr. Siddiqui Rahman. He is very often than not, confirms his attendance and never APS. I want to put it on record. This is not the one meeting that I am chairing. I have seen at least a half a dozen of such meetings where he has confirmed and he did not attend. But we are very happy and thankful to him that he, he did not appear. May I now at this point invite Dr. Shamsul Alam, Senior Secretary and member of the General Economics Division of the Planning Commission to make his presentation. He is our special guest in this plenary. And uh, Mr. Um, Alam, prior to his joining in the General Economics Division, he was in the faculty of Bangladesh Agricultural University since 1974 to 2009. Dr. Alam served as a visiting professor to a number of universities world over. Dr. Alam is the lead author of the first perspective plan of Bangladesh, 2010 to 21, and sixth and seventh five-year plans of Bangladesh. He led the preparation of Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100 
and is leading the preparation of the second prospective plan 21 to 41. Dr. Alam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A very good day and good afternoon to you all. I should not be quite long, I should be brief, but before that, I thank the uh, honorable discussants who actually uh, presented uh, how we can go with, you know, having more growth and uh, taking the country to a prosperous country. I also uh, respect our chief guest, Mr. Najibur Rahman, who is here. So, uh, our chair and distinguished participants. Referring to these initiatives of DCCI, I must say the opportune, opportune moment could not be uh, better than this while we are preparing, or uh, you can say finalizing the Vision 2041 document. And uh, on the basis of that Vision 2021, we'll be preparing the second uh, prospective plan of Bangladesh covering 2021 to 2041. So the recommendations, outputs, strategies, inputs we'll be receiving from, uh, from here. Uh, this will help us a lot in devising our strategies, in targeting the you know, milestone uh, goals we'll be achieving or we'll be setting to attain by 2041 to be a prosperous country. So, uh, I must uh, refer three things you all know, uh, which actually we can say a challenges of having accelerated growth in our country, at least to have 9% growth rate on average yearly by 2041 to be a, a rich country, to be a prosperous country, at least having uh, 16,000 US dollar per capita by then, because the threshold figure actually changes. It is now 12,000 US dollar. So by 2041, it would be something around 16,000. So we need to take the economy there if we uh, want to be a prosperous country, having 16, at least 16,000 of US dollar per capita. So our actually challenges are you all know. We are facing infrastructural inadequacy, the big bottleneck of our uh, no, accelerated growth. The second one, uh, as of me, skill human resources to increase, we need to increase factor productivity and for that we need skill human resources. The third one I should say, uh, energy security. We are uh, elevating a lot of uh, the problem of energy but still I think it's a big challenge to cope up uh, with the uh, growth process. Because while we will be a higher growth process, we'll have more demand for energy. 1% GDP growth actually uh, have derived demand of 1.5% energy demand. The fourth one I should say, improvement in economic governance to set the macroeconomic environment for businesses, good environment for businesses. And you all know, uh, we have mega projects now, a uh, couple of mega projects, when those will be completed uh, by 2024 uh, with our, uh, with our uh, no, uh, nuclear energy, uh, with oh, no, uh, our sky train, whole scenario will be changed with this mega project. But this would not be enough unless we go for more uh, projects like, you know, uh, underground train in Dhaka. We must have more tunnel, uh, no, tunnel uh, routes uh, uh, in the river Padma and Jomuna. Uh, we need to have uh, highway, uh, no, expressway on the highways. And uh, for those, we need to have more mega projects in the outline. Uh, the demand for small bridges, culverts, you know, uh, rural networks, is, uh, uh, I think, is over now because Bangladesh has the highest road density in the world in terms of rural networks and uh, road networks. 
So we need to switch over to mega projects, uh, what I refer to, what I refer to, you know, we need a deep sea port, we need a, another international airport. So all these would require, all these would require, uh, I think, uh, creation of a special uh, cutter, a special cutter for handling those mega projects because the big problem is we can't finish, uh, complete, uh, we can complete the projects as it is stipulated in the project document. It gets twice or 2.5 times higher the time uh, what is stipulated in the project document. We need to complete those projects in time to save, no, cost. Cost become 2.5 times higher if there is, no, uh, more time we uh, require to complete those. So we need to create a special managerial cutter for implementing those projects. This will be needed in future. Uh, our principal secretary is here. I hope uh, he would appreciate. Without one of the reasons for delay in uh, implementation mega projects is uh, inadequacy or absence of appropriate manpower, particularly having managerial skill. It's not only the design problem. It's not only the finance problem. It's the problem of managerial cadre. You all know the financing situation now we have, uh, we proposed in the seventh five-year plan that we need to have uh, at least on average eight billion US dollar annually to finance our infrastructure projects. But we only received, uh, this year only we received 0.94% of GDP, which is 2.58 billion US dollar. We propose to have 8.22 billion dollar. Actually, to have more uh, FDIs, foreign investment, we need to uh, we need to get rid of infrastructural uh, infrastructural inadequacy. We need to get rid of shortage of skill manpower. We need to have enough energy. What I referred to uh, before beginning of my speech, we need to have improved economic environment, economic governance, to actually attract FDIs. And uh, you all know this is not enough to have 9% growth rate as we forecast uh, to have on average by 2041. We need to go with, you know, first with the regional cooperation, a strong regional cooperation we need to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, need to materialize. We need to make BCIM, you no, know, uh, to in its full use. Uh, Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar cooperation. We need to have BBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal. We need to uh, no, uh, mobilize Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, what we call BIMS uh, no, uh, mobilizing. We need to mobilize BIMSTEC, Bangladesh, no, Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. All this need to be revitalized uh, to make the Bangladesh a hub of economic activities, a hub of growth, and to begin with, we need to facilitate, I believe, uh, to start with, let seven sisters of India, Nepal, Bhutan, use our ports. Of course, ports are quite, you know, congested now, you can say. So I said earlier that we need to have a seaport immediately, and uh, whatever we have now, two, three ports, let's uh, we allow seven sisters to use these ports, Nepal, Bhutan, we should allow them to have our experiences handling you know, foreign, uh, uh, foreign uh, what we call is transshipment, uh, transportation and all this. The other thing I would outline, if you allow me, we need to have many, many FTS. Vietnam, up until now, have 20 FTS, including Russia, South Korea, Japan. So Bangladesh, we could not even, up until now, uh, strike at least one FTA. We are trying with Sri Lanka. So even Vietnam started with Asian countries, free trade. Then it was 17. Now it is uh, 20 uh, FTS they have right now. So how to go with FTS? We need to go with that. Uh, we need to, you know, uh, put into practice 
that will create business environment in the country in a big way. For leapfrogging, we need to have more and more FTAs. And we need to continue with trade liberalization in the economy. And other source could be, uh, you know, debt GDP ratio. Our debt to GDP is only 30% right now. Even a small country like Belgium, they have debt, uh, debt GDP ratio is 107%, meaning whatever the GDP size, they, they uh, borrow more than that. Singapore, 110.5% GDP uh, they borrow from outside. Japan, 235% of the GDP they borrow, borrow from outside. So for any leaf throbbing, for you know, uh, business as well as usual uh, would not be enough to have 9% average growth rate uh, or we visualize that we will be a rich country unless we go, go with this kind of no, leaf throbbing or uh, with this kind of spar in the economy, it would be really difficult to be a, a prosperous country having 16,000 year dollar per capita. So I would urge, let us make ready to, to as we can borrow more, at least up to 2021 or uh, in the 8-5 year plan period, at least 60% of uh, debt GDP ratio should be 60%. And for that, we again need to, uh, to, to alleviate the infrastructural inadequacy, to have more human resources, to have energy security, we have good economic governance. So, but this is an opportunity uh, borrowing from outside. Nothing to be scared about that. Bangladesh, up until now, never failed to repay any debt. Of course, most of us, you know, grants or uh, concessional loans. Uh, I should, you uh, know, uh, in my speech or in my uh, uh, speech to you, to, face, to change the face of the economy. To the most, businesses should be supported with fiscal and monetary policy, uh, with fiscal and monetary tools. Leapfrogging only then can be effected. What I believe, if I sum up the whole of my discussion, our actions are our future. We need to act, act wisely, act with vision, act with plan. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shamsud Alam. And we are in a hurry now. I'm calling upon our chief guest, principal secretary to the prime minister, Mr. Muhammad Nazibur Rahman. Mr. Muhammad Nazibur Rahman, you all know, before he became the principal secretary, he was our secretary internal resources division and chairman of the National Board of Revenue. And he has, is, uh, to his credit, there are a number of other uh, experiences in the, the government offices. Mr. Rahman joined 1982 in the regular batch of Bangladesh Civil Service. He did his Bachelor's of Social Science and Master's in Sociology from the University of Dhaka. I now call upon Muhammad Najibur Rahman to make his presentation as the chief guest. Thank you, uh, Mr. Session Chair. Uh, distinguished uh, special guest, the very illuminating uh, panel, and uh, the members of the uh, Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industries in particular, and the business leaders from home and abroad in general, uh, the media invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and, and good afternoon. I'm looking at my watch. It is, uh, it has crossed the 2 p.m. Uh, deadline. We had, a, we had set up on us a deadline of 2 p.m. So it has already crossed. But I'm, I'm, I'm deeply uh, honored to be here as, as the chief guest, uh, Dhaka Chamber of Commerce President, 
and his uh, board has deeply uh, humbled me. And uh, this session is very important. This is, the, this is the first working session following a very high-profile opening of the, uh, of, the, of the conference. So I wanted to congratulate Dhaka Chamber of Commerce, especially the esteemed president, on, on three counts. Congratulations on your 60th anniversary. Congratulations for mobilizing such a huge number of leaders from the business community. And last but not least, congratulations for bringing the Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina on board and also honoring her with the Visionary Award, uh, something she deserves. And uh, as her Principal Secretary, I know that the Prime Minister has a Midas touch. Uh, whatever she starts, she starts from the core of her heart and she carries it forward in partnership with all concerned. And whenever we talk about the economy, it is her passion to see it growing further and further. And she underlines the importance of business community as being the engine of growth. So congratulations to all of you and congratulations to, to almost the, I would call him the doyen of the business community, Mr. Mahbubur Rahman, whom I am seeing uh, leading the business community ever since I have joined the civil service, you know, back in 1992 and also also earlier. So co colleagues, friends, I don't want to be long. I did a little bit of stint in diplomacy. And they say, don't stand before people and their lunch. Uh, we have also prayer to, to perform. So I'll be, I'll be very brief. I'm a I'm, I'm little nostalgic uh, because uh, after almost a year, I'm spending a long time with my friends from the business community because while in NBA, that was my daily activity to, to spend my time with you and learn from you and implement whatever, whatever is to be implemented in the real life, uh, learning from the business and the thing. So today, uh, while sitting on the dais, I was very interactive with, with all, every distinguished personalities at my right and left. And I was also reminiscing to recent conferences that I had attended. Uh, some of you were there in New York in September when the US Chamber of Commerce had organized a forum on, on the theme of Bangladesh of the future. And many of us, including uh, Mr. Asif Ibrahim and many of the business leaders, uh, Mr. Benajir was there, and uh, uh, the president of the Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce was there as well. They were very enthusiastic about Bangladesh. They were focusing Bangladesh as their next destination. You are now setting the stage and to welcome them. So I, I think the, the two, two, two dis I'm not responsible for that. I'm oh, sorry, this, I'm not responsible for this, but the two forum, the forum in New York and the forum in BICC now, Bangamundu International Conference Center, I'm seeing uh, they make the, they talk the same language. The Bangladesh is ready, Bangladesh is ready for business, and Bangladesh has come a long way on the, what you call, a development super highway. And the Honorable Prime Minister is leading by good example. She uh, made it aptly clear that she does not do business. It is the, uh, the goal of our government to facilitate business and you business leaders and making it happen. Secondly, last week or before, I went to Netherlands to attend another uh, big business summit uh, organized by World Skills. 
World Skills International, and you know that Bangladesh has become the newest member of the World Skills International Forum. Uh, something um, Sayyid Manju, Nasim Manju had, has alluded to on the importance of skill development. As you know, the Prime Minister's office will be hosting another entity known as National Skill Development Authority. That will be facilitating the skill development in Bangladesh. Uh, it will not work alone. It will build a bridge among all the initiative that is run by the business and the, and the, and the public sectors. And at the World Skill Center, I was, I was happy because before going there, I was always thinking about artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And I was thinking that there may be a, 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 a sort of a dichotomy between the two. Artificial intelligence and human ingenuity may be coming in contradiction to one another. And I was then uh, teaching and training people to be even more smarter so that they can, they can compete with an artificial intelligence. But at the World Skills International Forum, they said they need more human ingenuity, human intelligence, human resources to build more artificial uh, intelligence. So that is the kind of another message that there is an area where we can, we, can, we can further develop. So colleagues, friends, and business leaders, I wanted to congratulate you on whatever you have been doing. And this is the last part of my, 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 my point, that essentially today you have presented before everyone at home and abroad a Bangladesh model, a Bangladesh model of growth and development. And I have noted a couple of elements of that model. Number one is that there is the visionary leadership that is being provided by Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina on taking Bangladesh to a higher growth trajectory and vision 2021 to middle income country, 2030 achievement of SDG. My friend Ajad will come uh, in, in 45 minutes and then taking Bangladesh to a development status uh, 2041 and something we at PMO we do regularly with your presence when we organize the meetings of build and, and public-private partnership forum. So I'm seeing that the second element is the strong political will of the government to continue to, to support your initiatives. Thirdly, this is, you are all of you are the architect, that the stable macroeconomic framework that Bangladesh uh, enjoys, that is in place. Fourthly, I already said that in the whole scheme of this model, private sector is seen as the engine of growth. There is no controversy. And I have started, uh, many of us, we are now reorienting the higher civil service. We had invited these, all the secretaries to BPATC two weeks back uh, on, a, on a policy dialogue on how to facilitate change management because all the school of public policy and civil service will not work at this, at this stage. So they have to be real change manager and pursue out of the box policies. The, the fifth issue is the public-private partnership, which is the, uh, the emerging area in Bangladesh. And I'm seeing uh, Soyad Afsar sitting right in front of me. Uh, Bangladesh is seen as one of the uh, meritorious players in this field, uh, public-private partnership, because very recently, two weeks back, the Australian Public-Private Partnership Forum has awarded a gold award to Bangladesh Public-Private Partnership Authority. So congratulations, uh, Afsar, and maybe we give him a big, big round of applause. Secondly, uh, many of the private initiatives, public-private initiatives, 
coming from Malaysia, the Jill Mill project uh, partnership uh, between Rajuk and the Malaysian private sector uh, has been awarded the silver award by the same authority. So this is an emerging field. The, the sixth areas I'm seeing, and, I, and then I underline and acknowledge the proposal from Dhaka Chamber of Commerce on, on, on the need of establishing a national infrastructure development and monitoring authority, NIDMA. This is a very timely proposition. And yesterday when we went to uh, Potuakali, Paira, a deep sea port, uh, spent the whole day in the southern Bangladesh, in Potuakali and Borguna, visiting the port, the, the thermal power plant that has been mentioned already, and then went to uh, see other communication projects. We see uh, there, is, there was a revolution, there's a quite revolution, very silently happening in the, in the coastal area of Bangladesh, and the infrastructure projects are, are becoming uh, larger in both depth and, and dimension. So uh, I'm seeing that this is the characteristics of the future growth of the economy. It will be uh, definitely investment-led, and investment will be focused on larger infrastructure projects. And uh, lastly, we are seeing, uh, although uh, Sayyid Manjur Alahi has, uh, Nasim Manjur, Nasim Manjur, I'm, I'm sorry, Nasim Manjur has uh, sounded little cautious on the uh, human resources, on the human resources, because uh, Bangladesh is currently enjoying a demographic dividend, and we are focusing on developing uh, human resources in line with the industry need. So I'm seeing the uh, importance of involvement of persons like uh, Dr. Shamsul Alam, uh, people who have spent years in academia. There has to be that conversation between the industry and academia, what type of skill sets you need nowadays, and whether the academy uh, arena is producing same types of skill sets. So colleagues, uh, these are the uh, tantalizing topics. You can carry on for hours, and I have the habit of playing golf. I can stand for three hours and a half. So I, 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 do, I pretend not to do that here. I want to conclude my, uh, my time here, but uh, before I leave, I want to uh, appeal to you that uh, continue on your, on your good jobs. Uh, don't be constrained by past and present problems. Be inspired by future possibilities that Bangladesh offer. And in Bangladesh, I am seeing endless possibilities. And I am seeing you all ready to harness those potentialities and possibilities. That will be my taking home message. But I remain committed to whatever good suggestion you have given to put it into the policy matrix and start working for their implementation. Thank you, Dhaka Chamber of Commerce, for inviting me here. And thank you for organizing such a fruitful forum. Thank you, and enjoy your meal. আমি সামনে গেট দিয়ে দেখেছি যে কিছু ভদ্রলোক উইদাউট ব্যাজ এসে এখানে বসেছেন উইদাউট ব্যাজ অফ দ্য ডেলিগেট ব্যাজ নোবডি ইজ অ্যালাউড টু সিট হিয়ার আমার মনে হয় ইউ ক্যান চেক অন অন দোজ পিপল হু আর হু কেমে মেক দ্য মেড দ্য এন্ট্রি আমাদের উই আর অনলি বিহাইন্ড শেডিউল বাই ওয়ান আওয়ার 
but it was not intentional. You have all been there from the day one, but you will be having a sumptuous lunch in order to feed your appetite. And also you have le learned many particular uh, good points from all the distinguished speakers and the resource persons from their own experience. They have given you the insight how we can achieve those targets that has been set for the country. But here I wanted to make a few points in order to achieve our uh, target and achieve the accelerated growth of investment. We need to address certain issues of infrastructure deficiency, despite the fact that we have done many, many in the meantime, many mega projects, but Dhaka Chittagong Expressway, we have been talking about for a long time, but it's not been underway up to now. The four lane is already in, but it is a must in order to accelerate the growth and investment. Doubling capacity of the Chittagong port and cannot be shared with any neighbor. It's as simple as that. At this point in time, they cannot cope with the, our local cargo and, and we cannot share it with any, any, anyone else and it should be doubled for our use and our investment. Chittagong Pangao regular traffic must be ensured in order to um, ease the traffic on the uh, land and it has to be taken on a top priority basis but I do not know why it has not been taken the route. And traffic management must be made, I mean, vehicular traffic management must be made most scientific, automatic manner. There should not be traffic police in the street anymore. And if they manage the traffic, then the congestions and the road uh, yeah, will be there for all time to come. This has to be taken into care yeah, because in certain um, report I have found that how many crores taka that by traffic uh, uh, congestions and the disruptions? Huh? Well, One point three percent of the GDP. Let us take it that way. So this has to be money arrested by all means. This is to be seen in that sense. And the electricity we have developed the capacity thanks to the the pre present government for taking it on a top priority basis and now the capacity has been increased to the 20,000 megawatt and though the actual production may be about 14,000 plus but as, the, as we are growing and we look for the new investment the demand for the electricity also increasing right from the money, home consumers as well as from the industry. So this needs to be further extended and the energy, gas, and similar, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, petroleum has to be there in order to serve as the power to the industrial use. And industrial land, last but not the least, it has become very scarce. So the government planned 100 uh, economic zones but many of them did not come um, as, as it, is, it was expected. But this has to be developed in a priority basis so that FDI, all local investment, can come in in those sectors when, when it is needed. So therefore, for all those where the deficiencies are there, this has to be attended. With, with these uh, remarks and also the, the most important and practical um, recommendation that has been made by the resource persons today and I would like to say particularly thank you Mr. Koga, thank you Nasim Manzur, thank you Abrar, thank you Sir, uh, Dr. Samsul Alam, thank you Mashroor and thank you Janab Muktadir. And last but not the least, the, our chief guest, he has been a friend of the private sector um, um, so long, at times we, we used to say that he was a little 
uh, hard on, on certain issues, but at the end of the day, he was the friend of the private sector. Never, nevertheless, we would like to say thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And our, this session, we would now like to say is being closed, and the President of the Chamber would like to present some memento, and thereafter, we go for lunch. And next session will be here at 3. Please remember now it is 223. Thank you, honorable speakers. Thank you, honorable speakers, for a wonderful discussion. Thank you, honorable speakers, for a wonderful discussion. Now, I request Mr. Abul Kashim Khan. President DCCI to come up on stage and distribute crests to our distinguished guest. At the very first, I request Mr. Abul Kashim Khan to hand over the memento to our chief guest of the session, Mr. M.D. Najibur Rahman, Principal Secretary, Prime Minister's Office. And now, the crest will be given to our special guest of the session, Dr. Shamsul Alam, Senior Secretary General, Economics Division, Planning Commission, Ministry of Planning. After that, I request DCCI President to hand over the crest to the session chair, Mr. Mahbub Rahman, President ICC. And now, the speakers, I request Mr. Abul Kashim Khan to hand over the crest to Mr. Taiki Koga, representative of Jetro Dhaka Office, Mr. Abdul Muktadir, Chairman and Managing Director. And now, the speaker, I request Mr. Abul Kashim Khan to hand over the crest to Mr. Taiki Koga, representative of Jetro Dhaka Office. Mr. Abdul Muktadir, Chairman and Managing Director, Inceptor Pharmaceuticals Limited. Dr. M. Mashur Riyas, Senior Economist and Program Manager, IFC, the World Bank Group. 